Okay, we posted this yesterday, and we okay. gave a heads up to Eddie Werder and to uh, Eddie Pete. Eddie Werder. He told me I can call him Eddie years ago. I don't believe I, that I, for a second. I totally made that up. Okay, Peter Schrager later. Okay, here's a question I posted on the Twitters yesterday. Okay, you can start your NFL team with any three defensive players all time, any combo of positions. Okay, it doesn't have to be you know. The players you pick stay healthy for their entire career. And they're not on one team. No. It's anybody. Anybody, any era, any player, any position. But you get three. And my picks were Reggie White, Lawrence Taylor, and Ed Reed. And I got pretty good props for that. Okay. A lot of people picked Deion Sanders as their defensive All player. right. And we got lots of responses. Well, you can't go wrong with Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor. Those are unimpeachable. Especially if Lawrence Taylor is going to stay healthy. That's true. That's true. Well, Ed Werder covered Deion Sanders. Uh, Ed joins us now. Uh, your three defensive players all time, you get them for their entire careers, and they're healthy. Yeah, I'm going to take the obvious two and say Lawrence Taylor, Reggie White, and I'm going to go, I thought about Ed Reed, I thought about Deion Sanders, but I'm going to take Charles Woodson because oh. he could play corner and safety and in addition to intercepting passes, he rushed the quarterback and got sacks at an unusually high rate for a defensive back. Okay. How great was Dion? Dion was great. I mean, he was he could play offense, defense. He returned the ball on special teams. He was a unusual because he was a defensive player with offensive instincts when he got the ball in his hand. And I mean, you talk to guys like, you know, Troy Aikman who played with him and against him. He was legitimately a guy who created the question in the mind of a quarterback as to whether you were willing to challenge him on that side of the field. And the funniest thing I remember about Dion was kind of toward the end of his career in Dallas, there was a game on a Sunday where Peyton Manning and the Colts and Marvin Harrison, they threw at him an inordinate number of times, like 10 times. Hmm. And I, I had a uh, previously scheduled sit down with Dion uh, that next week. And so I asked him about this and he said, man, I ain't worried. I've been out there on that island longer than Gilligan. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he laughed, as you can imagine, and so did I. And as I was leaving the room a few minutes later, having finished the interview, he said, oh, man. And I'm like, I said, what? And he said, I wanted to save that line for the playoffs. <laughs> he was already thinking of what lines he wanted to use at the Super Bowl week. <laughs> Is Aaron Donald encroaching on Reggie yeah. White territory here? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think he's the most dominant defensive player in the league right now and has been for, you know, almost his entire career. So without question, he's the most feared defensive player in the NFL right now. But yeah, that's a great point. You know, I didn't really think of guys who are currently playing and I eliminated all the guys that I never saw myself. So, you know, Deacon Jones and guys like that, I Night Train Lane, those guys who might have merited consideration from a slightly older person, of which there are not many anymore. When we, um, when we look at players now, though, with Terrell Davis getting in and, and being injured and having a six-year <laughs> career, can you be a Hall of Famer after four years, five years? I, I've never been a Hall of Fame voter, so I don't really know what the cutoff is, but I know that's a major consideration is longevity of career, although they've certainly made concessions not only for players but even coaches You know, recently. That was one of the arguments against Jimmy Johnson was that he didn't coach long enough to – uh, to merit it. I thought it was a ridiculous argument in his case. And I think it, for the most part, longevity matters unless a player was just incredibly dominant. Um, and, and that led to championship performances where otherwise they would not have existed. So I think that's why Jimmy Johnson and Terrell Davis get exceptions. But if you like Aaron Donald, you win three defensive players of the year in let's say a five-year period or JJ Watt wins three, like, is, is that enough where the voters are going to go, that's an MVP, or uh, that—that's a, a Hall of Fame. Uh, I don't think I don't think those guys are going to have to win Super Bowls like most players would have to do, yeah. uh, because of the the reason you decided. I mean, to dominate at your position on a team that wasn't good enough to get to a championship, I think says an awful lot about those players too. The biggest question in Dallas today is what? Well, for a time, it, I don't. How are they going to rebound from this? Um, this was a, an, a, an epic disaster, even by their standards. Jerry Jones acknowledged as much, you know, after the game, saying that um, he, he couldn't remember being more disappointed, that he didn't see this coming, that when you have this collection of talent, you have to win. Um, and they didn't. Uh, not only did – I mean, this used to be a team that couldn't get to the NFC Championship game, couldn't get out of the divisional round. And this team wins 12 games, has a home game, and can't even get out of the wild card round. 
They were dominated at home. Only team to lose at home in Wild Card Weekend, Super Wild Card Weekend, uh, was the Cowboys. <laughs> well, you tweeted this out that you know the Cowboys' win total and point total was inflated by playing against bad teams in their own division, and this caught up Correct. with them. That you almost start to believe, hey, we can go out there and put fifty points. Hey, we got two defensive players who are impactful players. Well, were they impactful when they were playing against substandard teams? And that offense, was it good against substandard teams? Um, and I think we found out what the answer is here. You know, back in the 90s when the Cowboys were a dominant team, if you looked at the NFC East, I mean, you had Joe Gibbs coaching, you had, you know, Bill Parcells coaching, you had Lawrence Taylor, Phil Sims, you know, any number of great players, you know, Daryl um, – uh, why can't I think of his name all of a sudden? Daryl Green, um, Reggie White, all those guys were in that division. And so when you made it through that, that meant something. Like you were ready for anything at that point in the playoffs. And this team went 6-0 and against the NFC East, the only team in the league that went undefeated in its division. The point differential in those games, the Cowboys were plus 133. They were 6-6, six and six, including playoffs against non-division opponents, not only, not only teams that weren't as good, but teams that they didn't know as well. And the point differential was just 33, mm. plus 33 in yeah. way more games. Yeah. So, and, and if you look at it, you know, they, uh, at the end of the season, McCarthy talked about, you know, playing the way they did and trying to create momentum and, and uh, offensive confidence in that final game against the Eagles while the Eagles sat out like 16 starters. You know, the Cowboys scored 51 points and they were rolling into the playoffs and feel, but, you know, look at what happened to them. They, they scored 43 at the time of season high against Atlanta, went outside the division, lost the next week. They scored uh, 56 against Washington. Uh, that was their new high, went outside the division, lost the next week. And then they scored 51 against the Eagles, went outside the division in the playoffs, and lost. So, yeah, I think they got an inflated sense of self, and they weren't nearly the dominant team that the division made them appear to be. And then you have the coaching situation here. I know that Jerry Jones, I guess, is – said that Mike McCarthy is coming back. You're, you're The two coaches you want to keep, you're probably going to lose at least one of them, and Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore, but you're going to keep Mike McCarthy. Um, do you think that that's how this plays out? You lose both coordinators or just Dan Quinn? Well, it was interesting that right after the game when Jerry Jones came out of the losing locker room, a place he never expected to be on this particular Sunday, he did walk over to us, and I asked him directly about whether he would consider a coaching change under the circumstances. And I fully expected him to flatly shut it down, and he didn't. He said something to the effect of, I don't even want to address something oh, like so that. Oh, so you right, asked that right question. Okay. I, of course I did. <laughs> but, you know, because I, I, when I heard it, I was like, man, it's really easy. If you ask any owner of a playoff team right now, would they give you a, I don't know, I don't want to address that right now. Now, granted, no, most I, owners I think, don't do interviews, but right. it it felt like it was, hey, I, I can rubber stamp this and move on. And now he kind of left it in the ether there a little bit. Well, and, and let's put it in context. You know, Jerry Jones has been doing this for 30 years, and the first coach he fired was Tom Landry. Um, and he's either hired or fired or bought out every coach they've ever had in the history of the franchise. So he knows the gravity of the question, especially – in the circumstances we're talking about, this horrific loss that they've just suffered, which he fully admits. And, and he goes on after that answer to basically say, like I, I told you, like we had this incredible collection of talent. In other words, I as a general manager and we as a front office, we gave Mike <laughs> McCarthy this incredibly talented team and he train wrecked it at the, at the first opportunity in the postseason. So yeah, I think Jerry knew what he was saying. And now whether – they thought about that possibility, you know, for a few hours overnight. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he just wanted to make McCarthy feel uncomfortable that he wouldn't give him an endorsement in that moment. But and he still really hasn't said yet that he's coming back. It was Stephen Jones who said it yesterday uh, that he absolutely expected McCarthy back. And my understanding is McCarthy's going to speak to the media this afternoon uh, out at the Star, and I'll be there for that. Um, unless something I say on this show prevents that from happening, but, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I guess I, I yeah, it was, I think the question uh, becomes more legitimate and timely because of what you said, the circumstances of, Hey, Kellen Moore's interviewing with the Broncos yesterday. He's interviewing with the Vikings and the Dolphins this week. You know, Dan Quinn is probably going to get three or four offers 
Um, and do you want to lose this guy as a defensive coordinator who took the worst defense in franchise history and in one year turned it into a great asset that actually outplayed your offense most of the season? So, but I think since he hasn't prevented Dan Quinn from interviewing, I'm assuming he's decided he's going to keep Mike McCarthy and let Dan Quinn go if he has to. He's Ed Werder. He covers the NFL for the mothership, also covers the Cowboys, of course. You know, you start to look at the end of that game. I thought that that kind of washed away the sins of McCarthy and Dak Prescott in that game. Uh, that Dak didn't have a good game. And now it feels like the refs did this to us. And, and you know, that Dak didn't do this to us. You didn't do anything for the first three quarters. Right. And time management, clock management with Mike McCarthy. We've seen it before. We shouldn't be surprised at any of this. <laughs> you know, I didn't buy the, the excuse of, hey, we practice this. Well, if you practice it, you didn't practice this correctly. And it just felt like we're letting Dak Prescott off the hook a little bit, that that was a poor performance. Well, obviously, I think there were a lot of games where what we saw the other day played itself out happened in the Denver loss at home. It happened in the Raider loss at home. Uh, and it happened again against the 49ers, which is for three quarters, the offense does nothing. Yeah. Um, and then there's this frantic effort to get back in the game with some level of success. But in none of those games did they ever retake the lead. This was a team that never came from behind all season long. Um, but I don't think it was entirely Dak Prescott's fault. Do I think Dak in his first year back from this catastrophic injury he suffered last year was the same player? No, I don't think he was. Uh, he was not the dual threat that he was before that injury against the Giants last year. But I, I think the, the, the most significant problem they have is their offensive line and their inability to create a running game. And, you know, I mean, Ezekiel Elliott had one yard, averaged one yard per rush the other day against the 49ers before first contact, which is the worst uh, in four career playoff games for Zeke. And um, even though they played half the game, and Nick Bosa wasn't out there rushing the passer. Yeah. With a four-man rush, Dak got pressured 20 times and sacked five times. I think the biggest question about this offense is, how come there were so few times when Dak got the ball in the shotgun or dropped, got to the top of his drop and let it go because his, his first read or his second read was open? Where were those throws? It was constantly him holding the ball deep into the progression, pressure starting to come, and then dump it off somewhere. Uh, why isn't C.D. Lamb a bigger factor? Why isn't Tony Pollard used differently? I mean, to me, those are the bigger questions than, hey, how come Dak Prescott can't win a playoff game like this? Dak did have an apology, and as soon as I heard the words, I was like, oh, he's going to walk those words back, where he basically was, you know, saying, complimenting the uh, the crowd, the fans. He condoned, right, he condoned it. Yeah, throwing debris at the officials. Uh, but he, I guess he issued a statement yesterday. He did. The, the interesting thing was when, when he said it, um, he thought initially that people were talking about, he didn't see it happen. And so when it was described to him and he was asked about it in his post-game news conference, he thought people were throwing trash at Demarcus Lawrence and other players because some of them uh, were hit with some of the debris. Um, and then when some, when he, so he answered the question and he, and he criticized that behavior. But then when it was made clear to him that it was the officials who were the target, he said, you know, something like, well, credit to them then, you know, kind of a thing um, and endorse that. And I think what, it was out of character for Dak to say that. Uh, I think I think he meant what he said in terms of his apology. Uh, I think it was sincere and he regrets it now, whether there's fallout for that for the Cowboys next year as you know how games are called early in the season. That remains to be seen. But one of the things that happened to this team late in the year was I believe it probably was Mike McCarthy who basically gave the players um, the excuse for losing that the officials were against them. Like they were always trying to beat the opposing team and this third element, the officials. And the reality is they were the most penalized team in the NFL all regular season. They're the only team in the NFL, Dan, that had two games where they were assessed 14 penalties. The only team. There were only four such games in the whole league. They had half of them. <laughs> And so for, the, for them to be arguing, are there missed calls always against both teams in every game? But the fact that they're claiming that the officials are biased against them to the point that it's detrimental and actually causes them to lose, it's preposterous. And now that the Cowboys are out of the playoffs, what are you going to do? What are you covering now? Oh, there's, there's plenty more uh, Cowboys um, 
funerals to, to eulogize, <laughs> um, for me to officiate. Uh, I don't know. Normally, normally I go on and, and cover more playoff games and, and put them aside. But in this case, I think there's a little more interest in continuing to examine why this happened, even though you can argue same outcome they've had for 26 <laughs> consecutive seasons. <laughs> they many, don't get to a championship game. How many playoff wins have you covered for the Cowboys? A lot. Because I cover the '90s teams. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I covered all. I covered the three Super Bowl wins. I covered the, la- the loss in the championship game under Switzer to the 49ers. The, uh, I guess there have been three or four since you could say since Aikman's retirement. How many have you covered? And I would say there's what Aikman's or uh, Romo won one, Dax won one. That's it. There was no social media the last time they won. There was no internet the last time they won a Super Bowl, right? It was a better world, Ed. Oh, it was. It was. <laughs> oh, safe travels, Ed. Thank you, as always. Great to hear from you, buddy. Thanks for the invite, Dan. That's Ed Werder, ESPN NFL reporter. And, of course, he uh, covers the Cowboys.